Thank you so much. Well, I'm really excited to share with you my escapades of incident response uh, at home. My name is Sarah Cox, and there are two big factors that kind of led to the events that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, some of it is parenting stuff, and I'm going to get into that. Um, but the other note is kind of just professionally speaking, like why I arrived at a point where I thought this could be potentially useful. Uh, in 2013, I have been working kind of in the tech ed space. In 2013, I joined FireEye. Um, I currently work at Trellix. Uh, Trellix is an evolution of FireEye. So if you see those two things, they're the same. I was really lucky in that when I landed in my position, I had a, a supportive team and director who has always encouraged me to take on new responsibilities uh, and grow uh, my role outside of just kind of the training uh, development job that I was hired to do. Uh, leading up to in 2017 and 2019, getting sponsored to go to get my certifications for SANS, which is a great way to validate your feelings. If you're feeling insecure and you actually pass the test, it's like, okay, I could at least do that. Um, not crazy, though, I think a lot of people feel this. Even that, you know, through all that, you can, you can still feel like you might be lacking. Uh, and so this all led to, in March 2020, uh, what I'm going to refer to as the busting. So that's kind of the, the professional piece of this. The other thing I wanted to say is um, I teach at Merritt College in Oakland, and I often, my students will ask me, like, well, what certifications should I get or what projects should I work on? Um, I used to ask this question, and the answer I hated is like, we'll work on what interests you. And sadly, now that's the one that I gave you. So this was the perfect intersection of my interests, both like family and investigation. Um, and I will say, if you have something that's interesting to you, you're gonna like be animated and find the energy to work on it. It's probably gonna be pretty hard to find the one thing that you should learn that's gonna be the key skill for your dream job. So don't let that deter you. If there's something you want to dive into, the process of defining uh, something you want to learn, figuring out how you're going to learn it, finding resources, and actually going through that process is hugely valuable. So it's valuable for your outcomes. It's valuable for learning how we work. Um, you can talk about it in interviews. So um, this type of experience, you know, to find it for myself, these are the types of things you can do. And you might have a lot going on. You're not necessarily doing this like over and over and over. But if you find one or two in a year to work on, it's going to help you find out what you like and what you don't like and kind of help you narrow your focus. So uh, family-wise, what was going on, this was uh, March 2020. Uh, I have three children, uh, but this involved Daniel, my middle child, and Aiden, who was eight at the time. Uh, this was a pre-pandemic, so I was all like, oh, we're limiting device times. You get an hour a day. They had spent that. Uh, so Wednesday afternoon, they were home early from school, and I needed to run an errand. And I was just thinking, this is the perfect opportunity. It was the first time I ever left these particular two home alone. I said, I'm running out to the store, and you just can't use the computer. So I leave. I come back. Uh, I'm coming up the stairs. We live on the top floor of a apartment building, so you always hear whoever's coming. And as I come up the last set of stairs, Daniel is standing at the top of the floors. Mommy, mommy, mommy. Aiden was on the computer. He has incense because he has followed the rules, and his brother has gotten away with potentially getting free device time. Now, if you are a sibling or you are a parent of siblings, you know this inequality cannot stand. Aiden uh, is right there with him. Adam and Dave denied. So I knew that I could not take action on this claim based on what one or the other said, because I was going to tick one of them off. But I knew that I had the ability to get to the truth of the matter. Now, trying to frame this a little bit more seriously, we can consider this a case in unauthorized access, right? So we had someone potentially accessing a system that they should not have access. They did not, they did not have the authorization to do that, and they were back. Um, violating our family acceptable use policy, that is the rules. Um, and so what I'm gonna do in the next uh, 15 minutes or so is just walk through the response process that I use in the analysis of artifacts on the Windows system to kind of uncover what happened. Now I do wanna call out, I was like tr basically trying to bust Aiden because I strongly suspected that my eight year old is uh, device time. I just needed to prove it before we could have an actual conversation about this. So I did not follow anywhere near the like, best practices for incident response, uh, but it's going to give us a good opportunity to talk about what I should have done as we talk through this. Uh, anytime we're going to spend time looking at a case like this, I like to ground this in like the 
why this might be relevant and useful to talk to. Uh, so as we're thinking about like the modern threat landscape, you know, for reading uh, any kind of news articles we're aware of like ransomware and nation state and answers as to threat uh, activity affecting organizations that we are all working with. So we know those are relevant threats. Um, I was curious where insider threat fit into all of this, right? That's the analogy that I'm making. I didn't find a single resource that asked the question the way that I wanted to, so I pulled these numbers from a variety of resources. No, they're not normalized, so there's probably you know some variation. But I think that's a reasonable analogy to make. So from the Verizon report uh, in 2013, and all these uh, reports are listed here, uh, they found that 19% of the incidents in their data set included insider threat. And that doesn't mean someone acting with malicious uh, intent. It could be misconfigurations or errors. Um, but basically, like this type of analysis is something that would be useful, right? So, like, what is the data that you need to uncover this? All right. So, getting back to the events uh, at hand in March 2020, I had the lead from Daniel, right? Uh, basically, I thought what he said was potentially very plausible. Uh, so, I was expecting that Aiden may have actually been on the computer and accessing YouTube. And so I needed to define the evidence that was going to help me uh, uncover this activity. When we're talking about Windows-based systems, we have a big uh, set of potential areas of evidence that we can look through. Now, if you've ever attended a SANS course, these same areas, they cover in a lot of detail. They spend five days going over all the ways that you can track activity. I have about 10 more minutes left, so I'm going to be real targeted here. Um, and so what I'll first do is talk about the file system browser conferences. Another area that uh, was concerning to me, um, I talked about having come through fire, I am getting the training uh, from SAN. So I felt confident in like my ability to use this FireEye Enterprise tool to, to do this job, right? Like a very niche, I can do this super well, but I felt less confident that like I could do that without the support. I basically worried that like I what you know what was I without the tools? So this was an opportunity uh, to do uh, to do this analysis investigation. So I thought I'll start with the browser. Um, in terms of our browser forensics, we're going to expect to be able to see like which sites people have visited. We might have bookmarks that show that they were interested in those sites as you're navigating across the web. Cookies are set, and that can provide evidence that you've been on the system. Now, what's challenging with browser forensics? Each of the four major browsers stores those artifacts in different locations on the operating system in different file formats. So you have to know where to look, you have to have a tool that's going to parse them. Um, and so kind of just uh, making the connections as a user, right, we're thinking of the browsing history this way. We can see that. We might have used that to find a site we had been on previously. If we've ever used the system at the library or a hotel, maybe we've done the incognito mode, so this is not recorded. So I thought, okay, well, Aiden was on there, he's game. I'll probably be able to look in the history and see uh, what it was that he was doing. If I had been doing this the forensically sound way, I would have accessed the files in the, um, for those Chrome files under the app data folder structure. Um, these are the SQL databases. Um, and so for the purposes of this presentation, I, uh, I asked Aiden to help me out in recreating the events so I said, hey, Aiden, could you help me out? And I set up a Windows VM. Could you just spend 20 minutes watching YouTube? He clarified that this was not his official device time. This was extra. And then he was totally game. So we've, re <laughs> so we've reconstructed uh, these events. So in, um, so I pulled that file from the, this reconstruction here. And this was specifically for Chrome. And this is the, I want to show first the database structure. So these are all the artifacts that just your browser activity is going to see. So you've got. Uh, obviously, your browsing history is there. We've got uh, clusters of keywords and the uh, downloads you have. So there's a lot of really good stuff in there. And if I come over here to actually browse the data, I can see some of the key. I'm, I'm sorry, it's small. Some of the keywords that he searched, like the red pirate. Uh, or we can look at the URL table. And basically, we see a bunch of different YouTube uh, videos that he was watching during that session. No, this tool is DB Browser for SQLite. It's a free tool. It works on Windows and Mac. All right, so that, those are the Chrome artifacts. Now, if you're in an enterprise environment, you might not know which browser.
browser, the user prefers, right? So you probably want to have a way to look at all of the browsers. Nearsoft has a free tool called Browser History View, and when you install this, you get like a pop-up for accepting the EULA, and then it just reaches out in all of those places and grabs them and aggregates them together. So here I see like Internet Explorer and Chrome History all in one place. So it's kind of jump-starting my investigation, but it's still something that anyone has access to. Okay, again, I didn't do this because I was really focused on the busting, so I just logged onto this computer and opened up the history, and I was ready to, to uh, bring him to his knees, uh, but this is what I found. <laughs> he was eight, and he knew to clear his history. Now, he's standing over my shoulder, and I look at him, and I'm, I'm pointing out this is really suspicious, but apparently he was also savvy enough to know that this is purely circumstantial, because he's uh, sticking <laughs> to his guns. <laughs> So didn't get anywhere with that. Now, in pre preparation for this talk, I did a little bit more research. I didn't do this at the time. Uh, but Chrome also stores some recoverable data in the sessions folder. So if you've ever like closed Chrome and then opened it up and asked, do you want to restore um, your tabs, that's all saved on the operating system. So that there are lots of great features across all sorts of programs that help the user and make the user experience like more smooth. And those are immaculate forensic artifacts. So I didn't use this at the time, but I wanted to dig into it a little bit um, during my kind of post-analysis. And so I grabbed those files, and the first thing I did is just open them to see the format. And it's not really super consumable. Now, it's, there's probably parsers out there, but what, what I did is I scanned just for some keywords. So I saw like YouTube, I saw Google, and then I just uh, kind of in an exploratory way, was um, pulling out some of the strings to see what was in the data. Uh, and so I could see like the sessions, we had multiple sessions that he had searched for like food theorists and festive plays. That would have been the initial start and then he was probably clicking on like whatever was recommended coming next. Uh, and what's really interesting in there is if I search for the term clear, you can actually see that the browser data you can see where he cleared it. Now, there's no timestamps here, so it's it's a useful data point, but it doesn't give the complete picture. Uh, but that would be a better way to prove that the history had been cleared than uh, going and looking at it. Uh, one other thing I forgot to mention on these artifacts, you see the numbers on the files, those are epic timestamps, and so you can pop those in a converter and get a time. Um, in my investigation, they didn't end up being particularly useful. They translated to uh, April 4th, 2012. I think that comes maybe from like when the VM that I happened to use was created. I didn't have a great explanation for that. So that I decided to look you know, for something different. All right, so the, Chrome, the browser stuff was a little bit of a bust. I wasn't going to like acquire the file system and do some reconstruction. I was looking for the easy win. So my next uh, thought was to look at logging. I do training for Trellix with our um, log aggregation tools. So I work with these all the time. Uh, so I knew the event uh, system event ID 4624 tracks the login. I thought, okay, you know what? I don't care if he was on YouTube. I didn't say don't go on YouTube. I said don't go on the computer. So I just need to show that he was on it. Um, but again, I was using his system. I didn't have like robust tools. So I used Windows Event Viewer. And what I was looking for was an event uh, that had a timestamp. I knew the time I was out of the house. I had a 15 minute period that I was kind of browsing through. I needed to find his username, uh, and I was looking for login type 2, which he was hands on the keyboard. Um, one note on login events, there were a bunch of system and service accounts that uh, run that were not, as users not really aware of, that make a lot of noise, so you got to filter through that. Also, in an enterprise environment, like a login type 3 is going to help you track network activity, it's going to show uh, source addresses uh, for where things come from, so it's a really great artifact. Uh, so, I had to use Windows Event Viewer, I had to wrangle this tool because I'm not so, don't use it day in and day out, so I opened it up, I was like moving panes around, I figured out how to filter it down to 4624. I didn't find a way to look for the keyword Aiden, so I had to like click on each of these and, and try to find it, uh, but eventually I did find the event uh, that had the login type 2 and uh, Aiden in there. So at this point, he's still over my shoulder, I said, buddy, I can this is right, this is where you walked in. So this is the time you need to be honest with me. And fortunately, that did the trick. Uh, I had some success. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 